My name is Lydia Pyluk, and I would like to welcome all of you to the Runmead branch of the Toronto Public Library and to the A-List, uh, Toronto's premier author series. And we are grateful to the Canada Council for making this program possible. I am pleased to welcome author Nancy Richler, who will read from her latest book, The Imposter Bride, and then answer questions from the audience. Nancy Richler was born in Montreal where she discovered writing at the early age of seven. She left at 18 uh, to attend university and did not begin writing fiction until moving to Vancouver in the 1980s. Her debut novel, Throwaway Angels, was shortlisted for the Arthur Ellis Award for Best First Crime Novel. Her second novel, Your Mouth is Lovely, won the Canadian Jewish Book Award for Fiction and the Ade Wiso Literary Prize in Italy. Her newest book, The Imposter Bride, was shortlisted for the 2012 Scotiabank Giller Prize. Also, also, her short fiction has been published in various Canadian and American literary journals. After living in Vancouver, uh, for 25 years, she has returned to her hometown of Montreal. Please join me in welcoming Nancy Richler. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for the nice turnout. It's great to be here. Are there people here who have read the book, or am I introducing it to? So there are. Oh, wonderful. Okay, great. <laughs> I really like that. So. I don't have to do as much reading because I can do more talking and explaining, you know, how it came to be. Um, so, but I will start because I like to start with the opening pages just for those of you who haven't read it. Um, and also just to give you a sense of the voices as I hear it. This is um, Montreal in 1947. In a small room off a banquet hall in Montreal, Lily Kramer sat in silence with her new husband. It was summer and the room was hot. There were no windows and no door only a curtain beyond which the guests, almost none of whom she knew, washed down sponge cake and herring with shots of schnapps and vodka. Lily and her husband sat on either end of the couch on which she assumed they were meant to consummate their marriage. In front of the couch was a table laid with fruit and hard-boiled eggs. Her husband picked up a plum and rolled it in the palm of his hand. His name was Nathan, and she'd known him for a week. It was his brother Saul she'd been meant to marry a man she'd corresponded with but hadn't met, who had caught one glimpse of her as she disembarked at the station and decided he wouldn't have her. Lily watched Nathan roll the plum in his hand and wondered what his brother had seen in her that made him turn away. Nathan picked up a knife and began scoring the skin of the plum into sections. They had not yet touched, not even a brush of hand or lip upon becoming husband and wife. She could still count the number of glances they had exchanged. The first, when she'd sat out at the station where they were staying, so ashamed by the rejection at the station that she'd had to struggle to meet his gaze while he apologized on behalf of his brother and entire family. Your brother cannot even apologize on his own behalf, she asked. She was surprised by her shame, disappointed. She had no time to waste, no strength, on a man who fled at the mere sight of a woman. Or so she would have thought. Not even that, Nathan replied. No great loss then, she said, forcing a lightness she didn't feel into her voice. She had crossed two oceans to marry this Saul. She had nothing and no one to return to. The loss is his, Nathan said quietly. She had thought he would leave then, beat a hasty retreat from his brother's misdemeanor. But he didn't. He remained standing before her, shifting his weight from foot to foot. Would you like to sit down, she asked finally. His eyes were warm and brown. There was no pity in them and he seemed to like what he saw. Already there was heat in his gaze. He returned the next day to formalize their engagement. Why the rush, Lily wondered, when he reappeared at the door. It was not as if he was feel she were fielding other offers, would be taken by another if he didn't quickly stake his claim. But then she knew. She thought she knew. It was the rush of color to her face when he, first entered, when he had first entered the room, the lower gaze that she'd had to force upwards her chin raised in defiance of what she felt. He had returned to banish her shame, and he had brought witnesses and brandy, 
and the same heat in his gaze. He was a lucky man, Lily thought at that moment. His desire inclined him to acts of goodness. Do you speak Yiddish, he asked her that day? Do you speak English, he asked her that day? They'd been speaking Yiddish until then. Ticket, she answered. Bread, cousin, suitcase. Her English was good, near fluent in fact. It was her anger at that moment that made her conceal it. Sudden anger at his assumption that it was she who was the more ignorant of the two. She who spoke five languages and could get by in several others. Who had smuggled lives across borders he wouldn't even be able to find on a map. It was rage, in fact, that it should have come down to this. If Nathan Kramer would have her, she would have him and be grateful. She, who had held all of life and death between her two hands before dying and washing up into this pale afterlife of her own existence. Freedom, she continued. Buttons, trains. Buttons, he asked, smiling. Eisenberg, she said, naming the family that was hosting her, Saul's employer whose business was Buttons. Oh, yes, I understand, Nathan said, still smiling. He knew she spoke English. He had known from the expressions on her face as she'd followed his earlier conversations with the Eisenbergs, all in English. He had met Greenhorns before. He knew their nodding at wrong moments, their delayed smiles, awkward laughter, baffled eyes. There was none of that in her. She was tired, yes, after the long journey she had made, and certainly confused and distressed by his brother's behavior at the station. But she was not a woman who didn't understand what was being said all around her. She understood perfectly, and yet she pretended she didn't. That intrigued him. He had wanted her at once, had decided the moment he'd first stepped into the room. It was not her beauty that drew him, not merely her beauty. He saw it, of course, how could one not, the fine bones of her face, the smoky blue eyes. But it was a tension in her, a feral tension, part hunger, part fear. It was that which had quickened his blood, that, not her shame, which had, brought, which had made him return the next day with his witnesses and brandy. He had not expected to find such tension in the living room of Sam Eisenberg, the button king of Montreal. He had met many girls already in the living rooms of Jewish Montreal, nice girls and not so nice, intelligent girls, beautiful girls, wily, witty, hopeful girls. But this, no, not this. So that's sort of an unlikely beginning to a marriage. Um, I started this, it unfortunately was how my grandmother started her own marriage. Um, my grandmother on my father's side came from Europe to marry a man, sight unseen, um, my great uncle Wolf. And um, my uncle Wolf took a look at her at the station and he decided he didn't want to have her. And so there she was, left at the station. And um, I've always wondered what it would have been like to arrive. She didn't speak a language. She actually wasn't a beauty like this Lily. And she actually didn't have a capacity for languages. And the man who did marry her, my grandfather, was forced into it by the older brother. There were three brothers. And um, so the older brother had made the arrangement. And then when Uncle Wolf didn't, you know, didn't go for it, my poor <laughs> grandfather was, um, had to marry her. I say this, you know, I, 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 I feel, obviously, I love my grandmother, but what a situation. Um, and it, uh, so I started with that. That's what, it was a very interesting idea to me to try to imagine what her life would have been like, what it felt like. But as soon as I started writing, I, you know, really, as soon as I'd written the first paragraph, I knew that I was not writing about my own family. And um, first of all, my, my family came much earlier than this woman. This is right after the Second World War. And just the character, once you start writing, um, the characters do inform you, like you, you, you're, it's a combination of conscious and unconscious when you're writing. And just the description of Lily, all of a sudden I just had a sense of, um, this was a woman, the way she was dressed, this was the Second World War, this wasn't 1903. And I became interested in that era. And also, um, that was the era that I grew up in. And I wanted to write about post-war Montreal, what it was like, um, because post-war Montreal, Jewish Montreal had one of the highest percentage of Holocaust survivors of any city in the whole world outside of Israel. Um, I think it did have the highest proportion outside of Israel. And so our community, which was very long standing, um, all of a sudden had this influx, a very influential influx of people who they brought with them a richness from Europe, but they also brought with them a great deal of trauma. And I wanted to try to capture in this book what the community was like, what it felt like, what these people brought with them, what they might have gone through, because the truth of the matter is, um, 
as a youngster growing up there and among my friends, we looked down on refugees, we looked down on immigrants. We were superior. We had been born in Canada. And we, you know, it was, we didn't, I didn't have any sense of what their life might have been like. And I wanted to try to imagine that. Um, so that's what this book quickly became for me. Um, so that's some of the background. So another thing about Lily Azaroff, which some of you know because you've read the book, but some of you don't. Um, Lily Azaroff Kramer, she was not who she said she was. No one really is, I suppose, but Lily's deception was more literal than most. Her name before, she'd left it there in that beaten village where the first Lily had died, freeing, among other things, an identity card to replace the one she discarded, an identity that could propel a future if someone would just step into it. Someone would, of course. The village was in Poland, 1944. Nothing went unused. And here are some of the things that that someone acquired when she stole the identity of a girl she hadn't known at all in life. The name, first of all, Lily Azaroff. The identity card. A pair of woolen socks. A notebook filled with dreams and other scribblings. A single frosted stone. She pulled the socks over the threadbare ones she was already wearing. The identity card and notebook she stuffed into the waistband of her trousers, but not before memorizing the only item of practical worth in the notebook's pages a name, Sonia Nemitz, and an address in Tel Aviv. The stone, which she knew to be a diamond, she slipped inside her body. It was only then that she hesitated, only as she, ready to, as she was ready to leave that something as strong as her will to survive overtook her. She knew she should flee. Every instinct prodded her to leave that village at once and make her way back to the forest where she could wait until it was safe to start moving again, and then to move, to join the mass of refugees flooding west in the wake of the liberating army to fold herself into that mass and begin the life that might in time become her own. Move, she told herself, as she had told herself so many times over the past three years, her instincts always keeping her a few inches beyond death's grasp. But something other than instinct rose in her that day. She hesitated. Her eye lingered. Was it the angle of the dead girl's body, limbs slightly askew as her younger sisters had once been in sleep? A fragment of the girl's dreams that had floated up and entered her as she quickly leafed through the notebook? The shadow of a rat skittering, the smell of its next meal luring it closer. She stayed. She placed her open hand on the smooth, cold brow, passed it over sightless eyes, grayish blue like her own, and brought down the lids. The eyes would be covered. This was the least and most she felt she could do. She could bring down the lids of the eyes and hold them for a moment. This she did for the girl whose future she was stealing. And then she fled. So Lily has stolen someone's identity to come to Montreal, which was, you know, not uncommon, and it's common now. I mean, it was hard, it was actually impossible to get into Canada in 1947. I, borders had not yet opened at all to refugees, but, um, but even when they did, it was very tight, and people <coughs> came in whatever way they did, and, and I had a very close friend in high school whose greatest, darkest secret was to tell me that her family name was not actually the name I knew her by, but that somebody had died in DP camp and her father had taken the identity and in that way they were able to make a life and come to Canada. The issue of, of having a stolen identity is twofold. This friend often wondered, you know, her family had gone through so much to survive the war and then they came and in their new life their name was lost forever. And, um, and she told me the family name, and I've always held it in my mind as a memory, just sort of like as a personal thing to just know that her family name hadn't died because there'd been no survivors in her name. So that was very much in my mind with the book, but also the responsibility that, that she felt and that my character began to feel to some degree in carrying a name forward, that everybody who had once carried that name was dead, and so now there was a new life with this name, and, and in the case of this friend, um, they, you know, they had so many children that it, it's a, it's a very the family has been renewed, but it's not her family. It's, it's somebody else's family. So that was very interesting to me. And since I've written this book, I can't tell you how many people, like not like scores of people, but people I've known my whole life um, have told me that their name isn't that their family, their name is. So that just blew me away. Um, so it's more common than we know, and. Um, yeah, it's, it's really been very surprising. So, so that was one thing, you know, the sort of very practical, pragmatic reason for behind that. But also, I was really interested in exploring identity in this book. Um, I don't know about you, but in my life and my friends' lives and my family's lives, 
I don't think most people have like one identity which just goes like through your life. You start as a child. If you look back at your childhood now, there's like threads, but you really have different identities um, as you go through life. Like you have different experiences if you become a parent, if you've had terrible loss. Um, so I, I was interested in looking at one woman's life and just the degree of continuity and discontinuity, and then adding to that a trauma, which so many people in my community had growing up, and which so many people in our current community have. Uh, this is a country of immigrants. Um, many, many people coming here have come after terrible trauma. And so our neighbors and our friends and people in our schools, they're coming from trauma often and with a, a very different, with a, a broken identity, which they then have to renew. And so that was a big thing I was, in this case, she was so traumatized, and it took her many years to begin to form a life. She, you know, she couldn't, she leaves the family when the baby's three months old. Um, she leaves this marriage. So she couldn't actually start that new life, and yet she did start a new life under a very different identity and a very different name. And that's something I was looking at in this book and something I've been, you know, I, I hoped that readers would take away sort of a, an awareness of just how huge immigration is after um, a trauma like that and, tr and the enormity of trying to start a new life. So that's some of what was behind my own interest in writing it. And, um, and then there's, you know, there's the pleasure of writing about people that you've known your whole life and disguising them so that they, th you know, maybe they recognize. So I'm going to read one little part. <laughs> But this is like, uh, you know, this is my own little personal enjoyment. So this is the brother, Saul, who was supposed to marry her, but didn't marry her. Um, so this is at the wedding. Saul Kramer was among the guests at the wedding, the wedding that should have been his. Throughout the evening, he could be seen toasting the bride and groom and lifting his brother high above his head in dancing more frenzied than joyous. His voice boomed louder than that of any other guest. His face shone with sweat. L'chaim, he shouted, downing shot after shot of whiskey. He already regretted his decision. That was the sort of man Saul Kramer was. He ate brown bread for breakfast. He later wished he'd eaten white. Didn't merely wish, spent good time wondering how his day would have gone, how much better he would have felt, his gut, his entire being, had he only eaten white bread instead of brown. The bride looked good to him now. There was a boldness in her expression that he hadn't noticed before. That hadn't been there, he could swear, when she first stepped off the train. She'd look bewildered then, glancing around, waiting anxiously for someone to claim her. Pathetic is how she'd looked, a woman alone with no one to greet her, a piece of unclaimed baggage. She couldn't be expected to look otherwise, he realized, after all she'd been through. And he, in turn, wasn't expected to love her, just to marry her and stay married for as long as it took to slip her through a crack in Canada's doors, which had not yet reopened to refugees who were Jewish. The marriage, Saul's first, was to be an act of charity an act of charity for which he'd receive a small payment, a token of appreciation, nothing lavish, just enough to give him the start he'd been needing, the leg up that other young men, through no merit of their own, had received from family or other lucky breaks. Saul Kramer had had no lucky breaks. This marriage was to have been his first. When he saw the bride, though, he recoiled. Damaged goods, that's what he saw. A broken life, a frightened woman, a marriage that would bind him, however briefly, to grief. Let someone else marry her, he decided on the spot. He was a charitable man. No one would dispute it. He would never deny the widows and orphans of the world. But neither, it turned out, did he want to have to marry them. And why should he have to, with his looks and his smarts and the future that hummed just beyond his fingertips? Let someone else marry her, he told the busybody who'd arranged it. His charity did not extend to his marital bed. That's Uncle Saul. But those of you who read the book know it's not as bad as he seems in the first opening pages. And some authors say they, you know, that they say it's autobiographical, and some authors say, oh, nothing is from life. Well, obviously, it's from your own life because y even if it's not, you know, if you're not taking a character, it's how you perceive the world and what you make of experiences around you, and you take that raw material and turn it into fiction. So, Uncle Saul isn't actually someone that I, you know, he has characteristics of people, but. When I try to imagine my great uncle Wolf, I just kind of think he was. I never met him. He really was like that. He he abandoned my grandmother at the station, and then he abandoned the next wife he had. So it was a bad egg. So um, <laughs> so we're probably just as. Although I just heard again with the book coming out, I got an email. This is so great email. I got an email from somebody, and she says I'm an offspring of horrible uncle Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. 
So, and the irony is, I have Thunder Bay in this book. He was in Thunder Bay for part of his life. So you just don't know what your unconscious knows, you know? But then he had to abscond somewhere else. He was always getting into trouble. But anyway, she said the offspring are great, and um, so all's well that ends well. So, um, so, yeah. So, okay, but that's not this book. That's my family. <laughs> so um, the other, so Lily is starting out her life, and she's stolen this identity, and she's trying to figure out how to start her own life. And um, so I'm just going to read you. She has stolen, as you know, as I read, um, she has a, a diamond, and she has a rough diamond, uh, and she has a notebook. And the diamond, um, again, it, it's part, you know, I, I have a, my, my brother's in-laws, his mother-in-law was from Antwerp, and the day, and her parents were in the diamond business. And the day that the Nazis walked into Belgium, he woke up his wife and five daughters and said, we're leaving. And they walked to Portugal, and they survived, and they ended up in, um, in New York. And, and they credit their survival to having diamonds. Um, now, obviously, people had diamonds and they died, and people who didn't have it. But if you had something you could trade, um, it, really, it, it really increased your chances of surviving. And so I wanted to have that uh, in the book. Um, she's involved in, a tr in trying to save people in an underground business where people are moving across borders, and it's very important. Um, but I also, she also had a notebook. And since the girl she found was dead, a lot of the books, she's wondering what is her responsibility? How did she come to take this person's identity? How much did she owe this person? And she's trying to sort out what happened in Europe and, and how to go forward. So I'm just going to read you a little bit of the, um, of the voice of the woman who died and whose notebook she has. And this is in uh, Poland in 1944. Poland was um, liberated, Eastern Poland was liberated early by the Soviets coming through. And so, um, but not early enough for this girl. So the border kept moving further. The area of liberation kept moving further west, but this girl was still in Nazi-occupied Poland and hiding in the forest. And so this is what she writes. She was a young girl. Who am I? A mound of mud in an autumn field. A pile of leaves to the side of a forest path. I tuck my hands beneath me as you pass, press my face into the earth. I'm a blur of motion out the far corner of your eye, utter stillness by the time you fully turn your gaze. In your cities, I'm a rat, scurrying beneath the surface of your life. I hide in your sewers. I infect your dreams with pestilence. Vermin, you call me. Insect. Cur. Swine. Once, I was a girl. I think that's all I'm going to read about her, but I, I'm just going to, because um, so, so many of you have read this already, but in terms of writing the experience of people in Europe, um, I didn't want to write anything about, that's as close as I get to talking about experience during the war. I wanted to write this from the perspective of somebody of my generation. People often ask me how much research I did. I didn't do any research for this book because I wanted to capture what it was actually like for us growing up in the post-war era. And um, we all hear about the Holocaust, the Holocaust, the Holocaust now, but we didn't actually hear about it growing up. In the early years, there was no talk of it at all. And until 1963, the Eichmann trial, there was really no talk of it. So, but even, I'm younger than this character. I was born in 57, and she was born in 47, so she really wouldn't have heard much of it. But even those of us who were born in the 50s, um, the parents, friends never talked about it. It was very rare that there was a parent who discussed what actually happened. And it was very rare that we, we only started to piece together what was happening gradually. It certainly wasn't taught in the schools until much, much later. And so we got our information a bit from reading books, which, you know, there were a few memoirs coming out. I think, uh, I think Ellie Wiesel's memoir came out in, in the 50s, but there were very few memoirs. But we got our information from observing the adults around us. And we had to piece together what had happened through their behavior, through their strange behavior. And I, I really didn't want to write anything about, I didn't want to re-describe what happened in Europe. First of all, it's not mine to describe. But also, we read that, and, and I felt it would be more powerful to read it from the perspective of, of, of the damage that it, it took, the toll it took on, on a survivor. So that was my decision in, in telling it this way, not going into details. I'm going to just at, stop to ask if there are any questions. I can talk. A lot, but I don't. I, I'd be happy if if people have questions to.
take some, like to make it more interactive rather than me blabbing at you. So if there's any, if any of you have any, otherwise, really, I'll read more. But um, if you have questions, does anybody have anything they've wondered? Yes. All of the writing that was really Yes. This is, I'm really glad you asked that. Um, it, I was a little worried that it was too lyrical, that it was too beautifully written. Because I, you know, it's the only writing that's lyrical and that it would have been too, pre I don't mean beautiful, but like precious. But I've since found, um, and actually there's someone in this audience, a friend of mine who just went to, um, told me about a lecture. They've been, um, there was so much writing going on in the ghettos and even in the camps. And I just bought a book of poetry by a woman named Chava Rosenfarb, um, translated from the Yiddish. She, she says the, the, it was more important to them than eating, it was writing and creating art and expressing their, um, exp and finding beauty and also expressing what happened to them. So, so I had been worried. I thought, really, you're in the forest, you're trying to survive, you're really going to be writing like this? And it turns out there, they were, and there's, there, there are all sorts of projects now of people uncovering this. And actually, there were three. There, were, there was writing in the Warsaw Ghetto. There were programs of writing. And when the ghetto was about to li be liquidated, they, they hid it. And they've only found one. Is that right, Robin? Like they, they've only found one of the. They're still no, waiting. They found more than one, but one yeah. was damaged. One was damaged. Water damage. OK. Was OK. OK. So they. they're. There were three, so there's, there's still um, some hidden writing from the Warsaw Ghetto that has yet to be uncovered. Maybe it never will be. So I found that really interesting. So yes, I wrote everything in the I book. I find it yeah. very incredible because uh. I just felt she was a, a special writer. Definitely. Yes, yes. And, and so it, it, I never thought it was just a normal person's writing. It was obviously someone who was very skilled and held this very preciously. Yes, yes. And yes, I and it was very important to her. Yeah. But I wondered whether you actually found that poetry. Yeah, no, I I I wrote it, and I wanted it to be good writing because I, you know, one of the, we, we, you know, when so many people die, so much, so many lives are lost, but also so much talent is lost, and um, and so many potential writers and musicians, and and so I wanted her to have been somebody who would have been possibly a writer, an artist of some sort, and yet another voice that was silent. So yeah, I, I, it's heightened writing, because um, that was part of what I was trying to, yes, to do that. She was kind of with that, and almost a, a balance to it was the diamond. Yes, you know, the rough diamond. Yeah, yes, that's right. And the diamond is, is not, the diamond that is found is not a cut diamond. Um, it's a, a rough diamond. And I liked, you have to be careful using the imagery of a diamond, because you can really, it can become a cliche very quickly, a diamond. But I love the idea of a diamond because the way a diamond is formed, it's formed very deep in the earth and um, it's formed under circumstances of enormous catastrophe or pressure. There's like something happens in the earth that, f that something catastrophic that then pushes it up through the earth and it collects impurities as it rises up. And I could, it's just like being a person. So you're sort of born in this you know, situation. And then you, as you rise, you collect the impurities as you wade through life. And I saw that as a metaphor for Lily. But I tried not to kind of knock the reader over the head with it. And of course, because I don't knock the reader over the head with it, nobody's ever gotten it. So, <laughs> so I'm telling you. So, and I'm going, I'm going to preempt another question right now. I'm going to talk about the rocks. Um, <laughs> I, you know, in some circles, I get like, what's with the rocks? So for, in Jewish tradition, we leave a stone on a grave when we visit. And it's, um, it's a way of, of indicating that we've been there, that we have not forgotten this person. That, and I've heard, I don't know if this is true, that in the old days, there were grave robbers. And that if you had a stone there, people, the robbers knew that the stone, this grave was being cared for. And you couldn't get away with robbing it. Um, we still do it to the present day. We, you know, whenever we go to the cemetery, we leave a stone to say we were there. So it, that's probably the primary reason that I had. Um, I also, I, you've had audiences where people really are angry at Lily for sending, um, especially Jewish audiences. I've had quite a few women who just are so mad. I had a woman accost me in the airport and say, she, I was just minding my business, and she'd read the book, and she recognized me, because I'd been in the Montreal Gazette. She said, 
she had no reason to leave and she shouldn't have been sending the rocks. That was really horrible of her. So she says, I'm so mad at her. So obviously she's mad at me. So, and so, and I, I really, I hate when people get mad at me, especially about my books. So, um, so, but for me, the rocks were positive because I always collect rocks. Like I have so many rocks and whenever we move, I have to get rid of them because they have a lot of weight. Like I just moved across the country and I had like so many pounds of rocks and I had to leave them in Vancouver. But when I left, close friends actually gave me, a few of them gave me stones. So to me, it's a very positive association. And, um, you know, I, I love the connection to the earth and I love, it's a very primal thing. And so for me, it was very positive and it was a way for a woman who didn't have the words to express what had happened to her and in no way could, she felt horrible about abandoning her child. Um, it was a way of reaching out in a way that, reminded her daughter that she was still alive, that in some way she cared for her. Uh, Ruthie takes comfort in it, like she feels she's holding the same rock that her mother held, so she interprets it in that way. And it does get Ruthie interested. It's a, her mother was very ambivalent in a way she wanted her to look for her, in a way she didn't. But by sending the rocks, it ensured that Ruthie would actually not forget about her and would come look for her. So that's what's with the rocks, and I can't do better than that. Um, and you know, the diamond also is another sort of stone. So. Anybody have any other questions? Yes? Uh, the wounds seem to be all very strong. Yes. Book, and then, I don't know whether this was asked or whether not. Yeah. And the men, not so. Yes. Um, was that, uh, did you do that with the attention? No. Yeah, I, I find Nathan strong, but, um, but I've heard this before. He's there's sort of background <coughs> more than anything. They kind of get up, they go there, and they're living, and they come, you know, like they're not. Um, huge presences in the book. And that really actually reflects what my own experience was in the homes in Cote St. Luke in those years. The men got up, they went to work, the life was with the women. And, um, you know, that's just personal, you know, reflection. And it's interesting, I do a lot of book clubs in Montreal. Um, and it, it, it seems to, that's how people remember those years, you know, maybe it was just the 50s and 60s. But, and it's also personal, that's just, I had more interest in the women characters. Um, the women characters in my family were much more fiery and much more present. So it wasn't so much intentional as they, those are the characters that came to life. I actually tried to give Nathan a bit more life, because, um, you know, he doesn't do that much. But um, but it just, you know, the, for me, it was just like Ida Pearl and Bella, and that's just where the energy was, so I wasn't going to fight it. I just went with what was there. Yeah. Yes? Um, you mentioned that it was a difficult Yes. Yeah. I, it's a good question. You'd think it would, it's the only book I've written. I've written three novels, and it's the only one that's actually really drawn from my, my life, my childhood. My, my first novel actually was drawn from my life too. Um, but um, I really didn't want to write about Cote St. Luke where I grew up. I don't know why. It's hard. It, it was a sort of faceless suburb. I couldn't imagine um, how it's going to create a sense of place. In, you know, it was like a post-war suburb. Um, I, I just found it hard to write about my own childhood. I don't know. It, it was... It was much, and, and Ruthie's voice, it came so easily to me once I allowed it, but I really fought that. Like the voice, I was, I, it was, I'm writing more in my own voice in this book than anything I've written. That might be part of it. I really tend to hide behind veils when I write fiction, and there's much fear. I swore I would never write anything that had to do with the Holocaust, um, but if you were born in Montreal in a Jewish community, an Orthodox Jewish community, but any Jewish community in the 50s, and you're writing about that, you, this is what you're up against. So that was very hard. How is it going to come at it? I didn't want to do voice appropriation. I didn't, whose story is it to tell? So that was hard. And I was writing about a mother who abandoned her child, which is unheard of. Um, and yet it happened. And I knew I'd get a lot of response to that, which I have. Um, especially Holocaust survivors. So there were a lot of things in it that were very difficult for me personally. Um, now when I read it, I thought, well, what was so hard about that? But some books come out and they're finished. So that was The Angels, which is fine. It was my first novel. But even before my book launch, I started writing Your Mouth is Lovely. And I remember at the book launch, I was launching with Shani Mutu, who had a wonderful book out that year. And she said, are you working on anything? I said, I'm humming. Like, I'm so happy with what I'm writing. I'm just humming as I write this book. That book was just joy to write. Um, this book was pure hell. Yeah? One of the characters that really impacted on me was a very minor character. Uh -huh. was the teacher. Uh -huh. 
Oh yes, he's he is yeah he is to me actually the heart of the book. Um, he was I wrote that before I wrote the book. Um, he is both a conglomerate and a teacher. And when I read, I don't read that section out loud anymore um, for various reasons. I just I don't read it. But I did read it out loud twice, um, and both times. Like, people feel they had that teacher. No matter what Hebrew day school they went to in North America, they had that teacher. Because our teachers, the Hebrew day schools, were giving employment to people um, who, you know, they couldn't teach, and they were very damaged, and this is who taught us. And so, um, so yes, everybody who went to Hebrew day school in those years had a teacher like that. And we, knew that we knew these teachers were very damaged people and also very brave people, but um, we didn't know what, like, we were trying to piece it together. Yeah? Uh, can you talk a little bit about the character, Carrie? Yes. Uh, well, she, just. The friend. Yes, her, her best friend, yeah. Um, she's a conglomerate of, yeah, she, um, she's, yeah, she's like two or three of my friends sort of merged into one, sort of mouthy. Um, yeah, like, I think she's probably one of the characters more that I've drawn more from real life than than other ones. Is there anything particular about her or? No, I just thought she um, was a really good contrast mm -hmm. to Ruthie's character. Yes. Um, they balanced each other. Out well. Yes. They did enjoy her perspective of life. Yeah. It was just a little maybe lighter than whatever there was a part about her. It just kind of lightened yes. the book a bit. So yeah. I thought maybe that's really, I, well, you know, I did it for my own reason. You're right. It was a very heavy book to write, and I was always trying to sort of, you know, have something that wasn't quite so heavy. And even when I read this, like, sometimes if I'm at a festival, you know, and everybody, like, reads sort of lighter things, and then I get up. So, you know, and I don't want to kind of bring the room down. So I think I felt that as I was writing. It was, a very he it was very heavy material to be living with. So, yes, but that was also what my friends were like. I, you know, I tended to, like, mouthy, nervy, and they're still like that, so... So in my own life, they also lighten me up. Yeah. I thought Ruthie was very lucky because mm -hmm. she was well-loved. Yes, she was. Yes, she was. I'm glad you said that because one of the other things I was wanting to get at is that family doesn't always have to be biological. I mean, in this case, obviously, she had a father. But, but they were yeah, outside. that's right. And um, many of my friends didn't have, like, biological aunts or uncles, but they were so loved and cared for and... and um, so I, I wanted to show that, you know, even though her mother left, she, her mother left her in very good, good hands and had thought about it and knew she would be, father was very caring, that's right, and didn't marry, yeah, so I wanted to, so yes, thank you, I thought she was, yeah, okay, yeah. I was a little bit suspicious of Saul, yes. when he liked her so much, I wondered for a moment, Yes, well, I, I wonder too, yeah, because, you know, when you're writing, if you write like I do, I never know where I'm going, so I, for a while, I thought, wow, did, like, he get together with Lily? Like, so I sort of had to write my way through that, no, he didn't, so, yeah, but no, I did wonder, yeah, 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 yeah. He was too good to be true in that way, like, yeah, well, Lily wouldn't have had anything to do with him after that, she did have pride, like, she wasn't about to, you know, yeah, he would have. Believe me, he wasn't so good. Thank you. Thank you.